as you thought. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought. Real fans, real talk, reporting live from the cam. High in demand, so please stand by if you can. What we got is worth a lot, so put a tie on your plans. On court, talking sports through the eyes of the fans. With Trip Young, Emma Marie, Eric Sanchez. You heard what I said, we elite. Check the latest topics and stay ahead of the beat. Keep us in your topics and uh -huh. we ahead of the Yo. streets. It's Johnny Floss, bringing a different type of blend. Backing up Misfit to make sure y'all tuned in. You gotta watch, this show is one of a kind. Updates on your TV screen from 8 to 9. For the older folks, so even if you're younger, no matter what sport, this show, we got it covered. It's filmed live in the middle of BK, so ain't no better sports show to watch on Thursdays. Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought. Hey, what's going on, guys? Thank you so much for joining us for another episode of Real Fans, Real Talk. I'm your girl, Emerald Marie, and we have our co-host and a very, very special guest in the building, Trip Young and Legend in Two Games, and we have the lovely Scoop B. What's going on? What's up? It's really so good. Lovely. It's really good. Word. It's so nice you to know, have you back. Word. You couldn't go through quarantine TV and not have Scoop B up here. Man, it's it's like a fair reunion every time we get on. I'm glad to be on with you guys again. Except this time, it's not the usual studio. I think we take that for granted. It, but it's still good to see you guys digitally. No, that's yeah, we're still we're still pressing on, even not being you know in the studio as usual. But definitely, you know, couldn't uh, skip out the opportunity to have you come back on. How are you holding up during quarantine? Um, to be honest with you, I've been um getting a lot of good sleep. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of good sleep i've been getting so much good sleep that i didn't know it existed but um you know i guess when you take away travel time and you're at home and still being productive you realize like you know yeah. how much certain things you may take for granted like studio time like i said get on the plane going from city to city but that time that i might be traveling i've been really using it to just you know invest into myself and you know really and truly like just putting out good work yeah but you look rested. Your skin is glowing. You look great. <laughs> Thank you. Likewise. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. I'm good. So, you know, we're going to get into some sports. It's been a really odd couple of months. Um, we used to count every day how long it's been since sports, but now things are opening up. So, the discussion of just resuming NBA season. So, we have, you know, some players are, are uncomfortable. Last week, we spoke about Kyrie not wanting to uh, play because of what's going on in social justice movement. Um, so now, you know, basically the NBA are going to allow their athletes to put social justice slogans or names, just something to show solidarity on the back of their jerseys. Um, I think this is amazing. I think the NBA has always done an excellent job being ahead of issues that are going on. We always rave about how Adam Silver is just phenomenal in that regard of allowing them and just being um, on the same page with the players and what's going on. So I think it's really dope. If you really sit and you think about it, though, um, uh, to, to use a term uh, coined by uh, Rick Ross, uh, a song that he did from a while ago called Retro Super Future. Uh, we've definitely seen the names on the jerseys be, you know, utilized before. If you, if you go back to maybe the 2012, 2013 season, or 2013, 2014 season, you actually saw players have their nicknames on their jersey. So you saw like mm -hmm. Paul Pierce, the truth was on the back of his jersey. You saw Ray Allen, uh, Jesus Shuttlesworth. You saw, uh, yeah. you saw, um, you, you saw Dwayne Wade with Flash. So I mean, it, this is nothing relatively new, but it's the concept is surely different. Uh, yeah. particularly because of what's going on in the world right now. George Floyd death, Breonna Taylor um, at large. And by the way, the cops who are murdered at Breonna Taylor are still at large for those paying attention that needs to change at some point. I've seen some crazy memes with that. But, you know, when you talk about the yeah. NBA at large, um, I, I think um, they've always been progressive in the sense of, you know, the things that they do, um, the other leagues take notice and, you know, they set that standard. So, you know, the fact that they're yeah. doing something different um, doesn't really surprise me. Yeah, no, yeah. like it, it's crazy because we kind of, and every, a lot of people have been getting on Kyrie 
uh, you know, these past like couple of weeks just because of him kind of leading the charge for the players to not um, actually go back and play. And we have been speaking about just different things that they would be able to do with the NBA as that backing. And this is actually a, a, a great thing that you could do because now mm-hmm. you're talking about whether you have anything in the commercials, because that's what we kind of were talking about with them having different commercials. 48 minutes while the camera's on those on the basketball courts and you, you're seeing that on the jersey, whether it be Black Lives Matter, I Can't Breathe, you know, rest in peace, George Floyd, whatever, whatever it may be on the back of those jerseys, you got millions of people for 48 minutes and you're going to watch because there's nothing else that's on TV uh, but, you know, the NBA basketball right now. I'm sure all your favorite shows, they done stopped showing new episodes by now because Hollywood has been shut down for so long. So to actually have something like that with the players on the courts and it's like, all right, eyes on us, <laughs> you know, like I think it's, it's an amazing thing. I'm actually looking forward to season to seeing it. I love the idea. I mentioned it a few weeks ago that I felt that the players could use their power in a positive way to partner up with the league and continue to drive home the message. So with the new commercial that we see the NBA has partnered up with ESPN and now this movement of allowing the message on the back of the jersey as opposed to the names, it's in your face, it's in your living room for 48 minutes. Um, and, and we're talking several hours, actually, more than 48 minutes because – the new schedule just came out yesterday, and we see every day we're looking at double and triple headers. Uh, right. So it's a great opportunity to continue to drive home the message and not allow it to die out just because we get basketball back. This adds more support to what we were saying just last week about Kyrie saying, hey, look, listen, I don't want to play because I think it's insensitive to this movement. I think these players do have more power when they are in the limelight, when people are paying attention. And, you know, the whole world loves sports, whether you're – into the social justice, you know, civil rights movement that's happening or not, them being on that court, seeing those names, you know, that may prompt someone watching to Google and see what happened. And, you know, just, you know, make it, make people know that this is in your face. This is not going anywhere. Um, so, you know, we spoke about the social justice aspect of it, but we are still going through this Corona pandemic. And this is something that, you know, through, uh, during the protest, people seem to have forgotten, but there are still people who are completely concerned about the health of their families. Um, two players, Avery Bradley and Trevor Ariza, have both both opted out of this season of the restart, and uh, rightfully so. They both express concerns about you know keeping their family safe, and that it's just a risk returning back so soon. So what do you guys think about that? Because I think we've been so focused on Black Lives Matter, but there's still a pandemic. Wilson Chandler of the Brooklyn Nets as well um, has decided that he won't play and cited uh, a family as an issue. Um, to, to kind of um, take what you said and piggyback off of that, Emerald, um, when you look at, um, you know, people's de- decisions, you know, Trevor Ariza, for example, um, his issue was more along the lines of, you know, custody of his child as it relates to the mother of his child. Um, particularly because, um, you know, the, typically the NBA offseason is around this time. You know, the, yeah. by this time the NBA draft would have happened. Um, after 4th of July, you know, during 4th of July time, we're discussing free agency and who was going where, right. which was a zoo last year. Um, but what I'll say is uh, when you look at Trevor Reza's example, you know, in July, um, he is mandated to have from, from old documentation that, you know, basically is mandated that he spends a month with his son. So rather than take him with him to, you know, Orlando, he's taking that time, you know, to spend with his child. You know, as it relates to Avery Bradley and, and, and Kyrie Irving more specifically, um, you know, I, I could share with you that, you know, Kyrie and Avery were always on one accord uh, as it related to um, how they were going about it. And at times, you know, it was expressed that uh, to me, uh, intimated to me uh, by uh, various folks within uh, Kyrie's circle, as well as Kyrie, that, you know, basically, um, the media was making it seem as though, um, you know, those guys were divided. And then along came Kendrick Perkins, you know, who, who added his two cents about it. And, right. you know, what, what I think ends up happening sometimes in this case um, is that sometimes when we air our dirty laundry out, people don't always hear the, the actual message. You know, there was a conference call a few weeks ago uh, where Kyrie Irving, who was the vice president, uh, one of the vice presidents of the Players Association, Chris Paul was the president, you know, expressed a certain concern about, um, you know, what was going on and what gets lost in translation is, you know, everybody right. hears Kyrie's quotes, but there were other people on that call, spoke about four different people on that call, 
you know, that, that basically shared with me um, that it wasn't just Kyrie expressing those concerns. There are a lot of guys that don't want to play, um, that don't want to go to Orlando. And as you look at, you know, as of last week, the 9,000 reported added cases of COVID-19, um, I think um, it, it, it's worth an alarm because Florida was one of the first states uh, to kind of uh, relax um, the, the, the mandates as far as um, just various protocols that go along with just moving and moving around um, yeah. the state of Florida. But, you know, I, I'll add that, you know, when you, when you the NBA um, wants to get this done because if there's, the season doesn't resume, you'll actually be losing about $2 billion. And um, I think that, you know, Kyrie, I can tell you that what the, you know, guys decide to play or not or whether the NBA goes along with it, you know, he's, he's expressed that, you know, um, I, I'm, I'm going to go with whatever, you know, you guys decide to do, but, you know, he's a voice his opinion, and some of those opinions are from his NBA peers as well. So my only thing with Avery Bradley, which I, I had a question about, I'm, you know, if he wants to take off for his son, you know, because I guess he said, he said yeah. He's like, asymptomatic. Yeah. But I just didn't understand then why didn't he just say that before? Because, it, like, the week before he was saying that they shouldn't go back to play because of everything that's going on in the country with George Floyd. So mm-hmm. I didn't understand why not just – if that was the reason that you weren't going to go, why not just say that from the jump? Well, I think that um, to answer your question, in this, and I think this is this question I've, I've – or this statement I've made on, on multiple shows is it's almost like Colin Kaepernick. Um, is it about the flag or is it about police brutality? And in this case mm-hmm. with Avery Bradley and Kyrie Irving and, and, and others – you know, it's the same dichotomy. Is it about COVID-19 or is it about police brutality, particularly in the cases of Breonna Taylor, uh, who murders, uh, a.k.a. The, the police officers in that case still have not been arrested, as yeah. well as George Floyd. Um, so to answer your question directly, um, I'll say that I think that players are, are, are being very deliberate and careful in how they um, make uh, their assessment and what statement they put out when they decide what what statement they make when they decide um, you know whether they're gonna play or not. So I think they're just being very uh, very deliberate in, in their answer. Like that's the only thing I can really say. And then when you talk to certain players, some players actually do want to play. You know, I, I've spoken to some players. I, I use this analogy. It's literally like a bag of M&Ms or a bag of Skittles or Marilators. You have, you know, different colors, different different, te- different textures and flavors. Some guys want to play. Some guys don't want to play. Some guys don't want to play because of the health concern about COVID. Some guys don't want to play because of, you know, they feel like this sports stuff is going to be a distraction from what's really going on and, and, and makes people more comfortable. And the fact that many people are, you know, alert about what's going on with, you know, police brutality and just the state of black affairs at large. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I think there's a mix back then you talk to some guys who, you know, aren't officially retired, you know, like Larry Sanders, you know, spoke about it, spoke on TMZ. He told me about a week or two ago that, you know, he wanted to come back and, you know, he went on TMZ and said that that's what he wanted to do. There's some other guys that are out there you know, that, that, that have a desire to flex. So I think this opens up for certain people, but at the same time, certain people are, are concerned about their health. And I, I agree. Um, I think there's there's a lot of layers to this thing, and I respect any player who does not want to play for whatever their reason is. Um, mm-hmm. as, as Scoop highlighted, you know, whether it's family, whether it's COVID, you've got some guys who know they're pending free agents, like the forward over in the Wizards, who's not going to participate because he doesn't want to run the risk of possible injury. I want to send it back to you on this because what are you hearing about any preparations that are being made within the quote-unquote bubble Uh, Because the numbers are increasing. And the last I heard, the staff that's going to be working there amongst the players is still going to be allowed to leave. So is the NBA making any changes as far as how they're going to handle uh, anyone who isn't a player and they're leaving and coming back and forth? That kind of also goes along the lines of, you know, family members who, you know, are uh, going to accompany, you know, certain players. You know, I think when you look at a situation where you're allowed to bring a certain amount of family members to – um, you know, to bubble and they're able to come with you, um, you would somewhat imagine that they would be able to leave, you know, at, at their will. I don't know what their particular protocols are with that. I'm still gathering information just like many of my other colleagues are, so I don't want to misspeak. But what I will say is um, that is something to be considered. 
I, I actually took a trip to, to Disney um, in October, just on family vacation. And it's funny because when you get when you when you get to the to the area, you get on a boat and there's a ton of villas. Um, that you see as you're, you know, approaching. It's almost like if, if anybody's ever gone on vacation to Martha's Vineyard, it's like getting on that ferry and you go from Woods Hole to, you know, wherever you the docking station is, you can put your car on there, et cetera. And so when you look at Disney World, it is the perfect place, you know, for a college campus-like atmosphere that they, that, they, that they wanted, you know, to make that happen. But I, I think there are some concerns about, like, I said this the other day, when you look at like President Trump, for example, the, the process or the concept of building a wall in our mind, we can, we can fathom what building a wall may look like. Mm-hmm. When you hear the word bubble, is it literally going to be like Epcot Center over Disney World? Like what makes it a bubble? That's just a coin term that, that, that became used, but is it actually a bubble? Yeah, it's a false sense of... <laughs> And that's why yeah. I used to build the wall as the as that counter example because yeah. it's like okay, what makes the bubble so safe? You tell people that law enforcement will be there, you know, and that once you get on, you you, you can't you you you're not supposed to get off, or you know, you put those rings on that detect you know whether or not someone has it. You know, I, it makes me think about like an advanced version of Emerald. you like this. I went to the nail salon recently and I got a pedicure. <laughs> And the minute yeah. I walked in, the guy had like this point in this thing at me. I said, wait, what's going on? He was checking my temperature. And it's like, wow. you think about it, like, what's this, Star Trek? Like, he checked my temperature without giving me an actual thermometer. Like, he pointed something at me and checked my temperature. You know, and it's like, would you, I'm sure the, the things of that high tech sort in nature will be implemented, you know, in, in, in Orlando in the same regard. You know, I, I've had. Which. Uh, which can just open up a whole other can of worms because mm-hmm. you have, you know, a high sense of racial profiling going on. You have um, people feel uncomfortable when they're going through the airport and being checked and being just the intrusiveness of like checking you that I just, I don't know. I know they have to find ways to determine what the safety is in this bubble, but just what measurements do you take? Like this is something that we've never even seen before. You know, mm-hmm. so like your experience walking in the nail salon, you probably were caught off guard. Like, what are you doing? Like, you know what I mean? And so how do you do that? How do you do that in respect people's space? Um, so it's going to be a tough one to try to navigate how we're going to reopen in a safe way. Yeah, I thought that, uh, I mean, I would assume that they would not have anybody going in and out of, of the bubble. Because I think, I mean, if, if you're testing daily, um, you know, and every, everyone, like so whether you're working at the barbershop in the bubble or if you're game staff, referees, to players, if you're testing everybody every day and everybody has gone in with the negative uh, COVID test, then I, you know, I think it should be easier to kind of maintain if nobody's going in and out. Because once everybody's in and you know, all right, no one in here is, is positive for COVID. We have these tests. I was watching on the news yesterday. They have a, a new test that, that brings the time uh, down to about 15 minutes where they can get a return on the on the test. So I think that, yeah, if no one is going to know, I think they'll be able to manage. That's to Scoop's point of the, the bubble being a false sense of reality. Right. We have to remember that the information we've been receiving is pertaining towards the players and the NBA staff. But these hotels that they stay in or are going to be staying in, front desk, um, housekeeping, all those people don't live there. So they've got to, quote, unquote, leave the bubble to go home. There's so many... <sighs> you can't have a solid, super tight plan with this because all it takes is a delivery man. All it takes is seeing one of your significant others. It takes something. If I can interject for one minute, I don't normally do that. Please forgive me. Um, When I I look at, what I'll tell you is, is it relates to like mail and when it relates to deliveries. And there, it's almost like no comparison, but it reminds me of, the prison system, they, they, when players want to get mail, their mail actually is going to be inspected before they get it. Wow. There will be approved food services that will be allowed within um, the confines. There will be movies, certain movies that companies, like in some respects, like a partnership, movies, all Disney movies, like this will be a way for like almost like branding in a sense where you know, Disney is, you know, owned or ESPN is owned by Disney. There will be some things that 
co-joined with the whole Disney experience as it relates to, you know, uh, Disney being the parent company of ESPN, one of the television holders. And I'll add this, you know, the reason why the NBA is so adamant about finishing this season, aside from the $2 billion figure that I, that I gave you, uh, it specifically is because of the TV money. I don't know if you like, gentlemen and ladies know this, um, but in order for the contract yearly to be to be fortified, you have to play at least – you have to play, not even at least, you have to play 70 games or more in order for that money to transpire. So when you look at the 22 teams, 22 out of 30 that were invited, um, the reason why that is the case is because, okay, say they, they the, the teams start reporting, like I know the Brooklyn Nets locally, they report uh, to, to uh, Orlando on July 7th. Mm -hmm. um, say the season, these preseason games they play don't last into the playoffs. Mm -hmm. Those seventy games will still be played if they if they fall if they follow that schedule through. I believe it's mid to early August. Like you need right. those seventy games played. Mm -hmm. um, once those seventy games are played, then the playoffs starts. So you have first round, second round, conference finals, and finals, uh, which will last you through about late September or October. Um, but the reason why they, they're starting these preseason slash regular season continuation games is so that you make the 70 games mm. and you still get the, the TV money. Yeah. Otherwise, if you don't, there's this clause. So basically when the players were, some of the players were discussing um, whether or not they wanted to play, the collective bargaining agreement comes into play. So for those you know, who are paying attention, the collective bargaining agreement, if I'm not mistaken, uh, there's a shared revenue between the owners uh, as well as the players. I believe like it's called BRI. And so the owners get 51%, the players get 49%. In addition, the collective bargaining agreement, which runs through 2023 and 2024, uh, is, is basically in favor of, you know, the players to get these max deals. That's why Chris Paul at his 30, either 33 or 34 is his age. He still has a max deal with, with four or five years left of he's getting max money, which is why he's so hard to trade right now. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the new collective bargaining agreement benefits him. But if the players will decide that they wanted to strike, the owner's advantage is they can then go into something called force majeure within their contract, which you know voids the, the collect, that, that contract, which would then force the next season to potentially be a lockout. And particularly wow. with what went on with China uh, at the beginning of the season with Daryl Morey, in addition to what's going on with the coronavirus pandemic, that could have you know catastrophic impact on, on, on what goes on with the league. And you know what's what's interesting, and I don't want to you know overtalk, but what I'll say is, uh, yet let alone with the, what happened with China, uh, that was going to be catastrophic to the salary cap. Um, but you know if they force there to be a lockout, we could legitimately not have even more sports. So there's so many factors. Uh, within the collective bargaining agreement, health, and so many other things that that are that are weighing in on this, and it's a lot to digest. Yeah. Hey, Scoop. I want to ask you, what are you hearing? As you mentioned about the the CBA, how is this restart and abbreviated season for some teams? How is it going to affect the salary cap for next year? Um, and then the second part, what are you hearing about the OTAs that the teams that haven't been invited to Orlando? I've been hearing that there are plans of them trying to have their own OTAs and scrimmages. What are you hearing about that? Yeah, so look, if there's Knicks fans out there who just despise the Nets, um, th there has been talk about that amongst players. Nothing official. It would almost be like a um, what is it at the at the Garden every year? The uh, the uh, the what is it trip? Uh, NIT. Thank you. The NIT. It would be like the NIT. That that's been a discussion. Now nothing has you know has has been uh, solidified in that regard. Um, as it relates to your question, your first question about what was it, it was about? About the salary cap for next year. Because as you mentioned, with the, the mandatory 70 games to be able to, to recoup the money for this season, what's, what is the effect next season then on the salary cap? Or is it potentially going to be frozen where there won't be an increase? Will there be an increase? And I'm mainly asking because we know Giannis is becoming a free agent in another year and a half. So what is the impact on his potential free agency as well? Yeah, I still do think that his free agency, he's a, he's a max player. I think that those guys like Giannis, guys like LeBron, guys like Anthony Davis, you know, the James Hardens of the world, Kevin Durant's of the world, the Kyrie's of the world, this doesn't necessarily affect them in the same way than it would 
you know, a 10 day contract guy, uh, a guy who was a you know, veterans minimum type guy. Like, like you think about it, like DeMarcus Cousins was paid well early in his career and he decided that he wanted to sit out and really rehab his leg. I think that was a smart move because over the last couple of years, he's been taking these smaller deals. Now he's in a situation where he's, he'll be in tip top shape and we'll, we'll get another payday kind of similarly to Dwight Howard where, you know, he showed and proved this year. Uh, and then even Carmelo Anthony in, in, in certain respects, uh, which I, I have been hearing um, that next season could actually be his last season. Um, but, you know, and, and to, to, to be more specific to your question about um, just about contracts and that, I, I think the jury is still out on you know, what's what. Um, I think when you look at Giannis Antetokounmpo, who, who will be um, an unrestricted free agent next season, um, he'll have to pick up the letter. You know, you look at teams like, you know, the Milwaukee Bucks, who, you know, are is his team that will be probably offering him the moon and the stars. But teams like Miami, who has been, you know, who have been, excuse me, um, you know, moving the right way post LeBron, Bosch, Wade, um, you know, and need some heart, some, some, some pieces to match with uh, Jimmy Butler, Tyler Hero, and more. You know, Giannis would be a perfect fit there as well as, you know, even the New York Knicks who didn't spend a lot of money last season and, you know, are looking to retool their whole front office you know, signing Worldwide West, uh, William Wesley and, um, you know, and, and you know, Leon Rose as, as, the, as the team president. So um, I think there's a lot of things that we're still trying to figure out as it relates to, you know, the finances and stuff. But the thing that really was just alarming to me was, you know, in the preseason just discussing, you know, how China and the comments that Darren Morey made, true or not, you know, affected the financial piece of uh, a basketball related things because we do a lot of business in China and you, as, as you know, people or, or, or natives or uh, United States citizens, uh, I want to say a native of the United States, United States citizens. Um, I, I think that when you look at just the financial piece of what's going on, it, it, I've heard specifically that they may have to do some restructuring to the, the, um, the, the collective bargaining agreement just because, you know, we're heading into officially a recession. Um, and th there are some things that are going to change, particularly because of ticket sales. If you don't have fans in the seats, how do you pay your bills? Yeah, they, you can sell merchandising but, and things of that sort, but the, the fan experience and fans spending money pay the bills and, and keep the contracts rolling. Who would have thought that this, <laughs> that a huge entity like the NBA would be even in this position to not be able to fulfill seats because of a pandemic? Um, you know, it's so crazy that you brought up the comments about China because I don't mm -hmm. think people understand how significant that was. We're still going to feel that now because the business that we yeah. do with China is just insane. And that mixed with, let's say, next season does turn into a lockout situation, it's going to be really bad. And, you know, so... I can understand some of the players that just kind of going back to our original uh, conversation that don't want to play, um, just kind of seeing the way things are going to be in this bubble when, when things do roll out. So it's, it's pretty insane. Um, the NBA did release their schedule. So they're scheduled uh, eight games on opening day. So, I mean, we'll see how this plays out. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing the resume, but at the same time, I do like that, our whole world has stopped because of the quarantine and social justice. And I think it's changed a lot of people and it, it's changed a lot of these athletes as well. Yeah. Emerald, see, I'll, I'll let you talk this time. Um, <laughs> what, I'll, <laughs> what I'll add, you know, what I'll add is, you know, when you look at the, uh, the bubble uh, and the proposed schedule or the schedule that will be, um, I don't know if you guys kind of thought this, but it, it kind of reminds me of, you know, Thanksgiving time uh, during the Maui's Invitational. Um, mm -hmm. how you know you just have all of these games just in a gym all day like if you you love basketball you're going to be watching from sun up to sundown it's yeah. a combination of like that Maui Invitational except with no fans and you think of the Maui Invitational though the, the, like if you have a 12 like if it's games from like 12 to like 8 you, you, you figure like the the, 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 the the undercard game so to speak are more less fans and as the night progresses you know, you, you, the, the gym is jam-packed. It's kind of like, you know, when you're in high school, you got the freshman game, JV, and varsity. Yep. As, the, as the day progresses, those three games, you know, you get more and more fans. It, 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 to me, it, it has that same feel. Um, and, and I do think, you know, for, from, the, from the contractual perspective with the TNT, uh, the NBA TV, the ESPN, one, two, three, the, the Portes, et cetera, 
you know, they can use the viewership right now because, you know, there's no more last dance. You know, you can only show but yeah. so much classic retro games of, you know, the, the 05 or, or 06 or 07 finals or the 91, 92 finals with Jordan and the Bulls. So, you know, this is, this is, this is opening things up. I mean, I'll tell you, the NBA uh, elite office uh, in New York was, was laid off a hundred workers. And I'm telling, I'm yeah. talking like public relations, I'm talking the hospitality and hotel uh, brand arm of things. Like, you know, this, 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 you know, lack of playing affects a lot of people. You know, you talk to people, you know, like I, I took a vacation in January to Mexico and I'm still in touch with some of the, the, the service workers who were there, you know, and, and they were telling me, on, uh, they were telling me on Instagram that, you know, basically, you know, like we depend on America for, for travel, but it's not just America. It's all over the world that, right. you know, it's, it's affected just the, the, the state of being. So it's a lot going on. Yeah. Do you know if they've um, spoken on, on the press? Or as like you know, press conferences after the games. Are they gonna do try to do some virtual or what's gonna? So, so there's three tiers. Um, the way that it was told to me uh, from someone in the league office, but basically, um, you have media that will stay at a resort there, and then we'll do like there'll be a room where you get questions and you your interview and do what you need to do. Um, and then there's another tier where you may stay in a hotel off. The, the the area where the where the where the resorts are, um, mm-hmm. but that basically there's a there's certain reporters that I've spoken to and I've asked them, you know, are you going? And they're kind of like, my my organization doesn't want to pay, you know, to go. So there's there's some reporters who are going. Um, there's some reporters who I've talked to where, you know, they they have relationships with with players and they're getting information from players and and GMs and you know front office people what have you. And and then there's some people who just are like. You know, there, there are some journalists I know that just during the pandemic, it's been rough because they may not have those relationships and they may, they're may they only going to games to get, you know, quotes and then they're out. You know, so yeah. there's a situation where they, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mixed bag, but you figure that the Yahoo Sports is the ESPN, certain folks in athletic, like I'll tell you, even from the perspective of the athletic, I believe yeah. if I'm not mistaken, eight to, per eight to nine percent of, of, of writers there um, not just basketball, baseball, and football have gotten laid off. Like this has has this had a residual effect, you know, to people who cover the game. And I think that this is where you really, if you're a journalist, have to make yourself quite valuable um, in in ways that still connect sports, or even ways that don't. You know, I remember as a kid, my mom telling me, you know, there's more to life than basketball. And how prophetic that was at, at 13, 14, 15 years old when she told me that. You know, you you got to yeah. find ways to stay relevant. Yeah. I completely agree with you because smaller outlets are going to struggle if you don't have that capital. It's already difficult when you are starting a podcast or you're a part of an outlet. In my last two years, I've worked with nothing but smaller outlets, blogs that had a buzz but still didn't have that budget. So, Mm -hmm. you know, it's going to be difficult if you're not going to be able to, you know, go to Orlando, sustain yourself outside of just reporting, taking care of your reporters, um, and then not to mention, like you said, all the people who've been laid off. So making yourself mm-hmm. valuable and drawing attention to your own platforms, you know, is going to be it's just extremely crucial. Hey, hey Scoop, um, with all the changes that are taking place in the NBA, obviously we got the restart. The draft has been pushed back. Free agency has been pushed back. Is the NBA looking to permanently change the start date of their season? Or what's going to happen now that, again, this season is going to end looking like September, early October. Mm-hmm. How are they going to move forward for the future seasons as far as a restart and free agency and a draft? Interesting question. Very good question. Um, basically, what I can tell you is, first of all, the draft will likely be October. Uh, so somewhere in the late stages of October um, and free agency would soon follow. What I'll share is they have kicked the can around quite a bit about over the years, not just now, about starting in December, you know, when you look at the last lockout, uh, when, you know, they started on Christmas Day, and Derrick Rose put on a show against the Los Angeles Lakers, got the Bulls a win. Um, there's been conversations about that so that there would not have to be such a, a press or, 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 or just that, that, that discussion of competing with the NFL um, for the NBA. You know, I spoke to uh, someone within the NFL confines that, Said that the NFL could potentially push back to October, you know, because there's been no training camp or anything of that sort. So um, there's there's 
definitely been conversation over the years uh, concerning, you know, pushing um, basketball back permanently um, because there are players who complain about 82 games. But the funny thing about it is you look at Major League Baseball, they're playing 60 games this season. If anyone should be complaining about the amount of games, I would think baseball players would complain because what is it, 181 game schedule, I believe? Uh, or something uh, 100 and, 162. They, they've been complaining, but it got to the point where uh, the commissioner actually had to step in now and get it going because the players and ownership just can't come to, to an agreement on how many games they would play. Yeah. So, you know, when you to, to answer your question specifically about basketball, so um, there has been discussion about resuming next season in December. Uh, mm-hmm. But there's also the wiggle room, you know, to kind of um, push it further back if they have to. They kind of have that that luxury, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, moving forward uh, and speaking to different people, there, there seems to be a belief that this is really like a two-year project. Meaning, yeah. okay, you resume the season now for the, the 19... 19- 20 season, 2020, mm-hmm. 2020 season, and then you zoom in and be done, you know, this year, and then, you know, potentially December, like maybe around Christmas time, maybe a little earlier, you start the 2020, 2021 season, and then at some point, you have enough space where it can go back to normal. I, I mean, if you really think about it, though, every year, the NBA has found a way to, to find little ways to, to, to start season early. So, for example, right, so I remember in the 90s, you started the season around Halloween or November 1st, right? Then what happened was the NBA moved it up two weeks. Why is that significant? Because when you move it up two weeks in October, if you start October 15th, Mm -hmm. that gives you extra wiggle time after the All-Star game. Remember, the All-Star game would be like that Sunday. and Guys would probably get back to playing like Tuesday or Wednesday Mm -hmm. after being at All-Star from like Wednesday or Thursday the week before. Right. So now you, you have, like, the season may start after All-Star weekend, like that Sunday. The players may stay in that respective city to, like, Monday or Tuesday, then leave, or go on a quick vacation and then come back. So they start their season, you know, resume it, like, on a Friday or a Thursday, that, that Thursday, Friday, or Saturday, that, 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 that week. So I think the NBA has tried different things, and I think that there's been so many different tests that have been done, specifically, like, during the first lockout in the 90s, like, where players – you know, um, we're, we're complaining about um, just amenities. So, like, when you look at the situation where they returned, they were very overweight. I'll be honest with you, you didn't ask this, but I'll share this with you. There have been some players who have told me they haven't picked up the basketball since, you know, play or, or, or since the coronavirus pandemic hit. They've been focused on family. Their mind is not on basketball. Yeah. Both of the coaches yeah. who feel that way. So it's like now, I think the thing that I'm concerned about is injuries and how that's going to affect people's contracts in the next year or two. Um, by lack of conditioning. You know? Who do you think is going to have benefited most from this time off? Which team going in? And which team do you feel like them this long break will, will affect them to most? I, I guess as far as the top teams go that we really say have a legitimate chance of of winning the, the title this year, who do you think may run into a roadblock early because they're just not – ready yet they haven't like fully got back in i I think the portland trailblazers are going to benefit from this break um specifically because their foundation of who they are this year kind of got trampled um because of damian lillard's uh health and injuries and sitting out uh cj mccollum yusuf nurkic um and then you know you brought in carmelo anthony uh who i i think you know has an opportunity to really shine, even though he's one of the players who, you know, has a, a difference in philosophy upon the return um, yeah. of, of basketball. So, you know, I, I, I think the Portland Trailblazers, a team who, you know, made an appearance in the NBA's Western Conference Finals against the Golden State Warriors, who were the eventual, eventual Western Conference champion uh, last season, uh, is a case study in, you know, uh, a team that benefited from some rest. Uh, another team to consider in that regard is the Philadelphia 76ers, uh, who, mm-hmm. you know, at points during the season, you know, early in the season, people considered Joel Embiid an MVP candidate uh, yeah. and, and just dealt with injuries. And, you know, then you look at Ben Simmons, the same, the same guy who, 
you know, had some issues with injuries throughout the course of the season. And, you know, I think he's um, – he, the cohesiveness of he and, and Joel Embiid will, will be something that will be worth watching. In addition to they made moves, you know, at the trading deadline to bring in guys like Glenn Robinson, the third, Alec Burks, and, and right. I spoke to you know, Glenn and, you know, I told him, how do you make that transition from being a slam dunk champion in 2017 – you know, to kind of reviving your career in Philadelphia. He said, you know, this is his second stint in Philly. And, you know, he's, he's looking to really make some noise after spending time with the Warriors who, you know, were going through a rebuild this season. So I think the Sixers, the 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 the, um, the, the, uh, the Portland Trailblazers, and yeah, I agree. I'd, be re- I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the Los Angeles Lakers, uh, a team who, you know, had a lot of challenges going into the season, a brand new coach in Frank Vogel, new assistant coaching staff in line, like Miami Hollings, uh, Jason Kidd, as, as, mm-hmm. as well as Phil Handy, who won a championship with the Toronto Raptors as an assistant with the last year. You know, you made that trade in June of last year to bring in Anthony Davis. You brought in some pieces and DeMarcus Cousins, who was injured, and brought in Dwight Howard was a surprise. I mean, I, I, I've spoken to some members of the Lakers who have said to me, they feel as though they are uh, the most underdog first place team that there is. God bless you. Um, so when you look at that situation with the Lakers, I definitely think LeBron James has been, you know, laser focused and and more. And, you know, I I think you look at the Celtics. They're another team, you know, that I think could be competitive in the NBA's Eastern Conference. And the Memphis Grizzlies. I think that they're going to be an interesting dichotomy as well. There's a lot of exciting young teams out there. Um, But I I do still do think that the the Western Conference will likely go through either L.A. team, the, the Clippers. You know, the Clippers are very quiet, but they that whole load management thing, now seems to be to their benefit now because they've had extra time to rest. And uh, it's going to be a battle yeah. between those two Los Angeles teams in Orlando. Yes. I, I think the rest was much needed. I got to uh, experience going to a lot of Sixers games and just seeing, you know, certain people bat- battle with injuries and just take their time to get back right now. I think that it's going to be beneficial. And I also think quarantine allowed not only players but coaches, to your point, to reconsider – just spending time with their family. Like I've, I've been saying this whole time watching, um, we got the ability to watch our favorite celebrities and athletes online a little bit more and get to know them a lot more. Um, and, and it had people really reconsider. Um, my uncle, who has been a NFL coach for years, this is the first time I've seen him around. I He has missed mm-hmm. so much of his kids' li- life. And this, um, this week, actually, his son graduated high school and his daughter, you know, and he just, he, they've never seen their dad this much ever. And so I can understand, even though some of these players, back to our original conversation, don't want to necessarily play, this is the first time these people are working so hard, making millions, not even enjoying the house that they live in, not even enjoying their family. So this is the first time, you know, those individuals have had the opportunity to take that time off. Sure. Um, so I know we've dug deep into NBA, um, and there's just so much going on, but I do want to touch on NFL real quick before we wrap up. So we know that the fight for social injustice and just the reform has been something that blackboard Kaepernick, blackballed Kaepernick rather. Um, so there's been a lot of talk about teams signing him, um, which I don't know how accurate that is because I've also seen reports that, you know, not much has changed um, as far as his relationship with the NFL we watched a whole press conference where his name was not mentioned in the apology, but we know it's about Kaepernick. So, I mean, how do you guys even feel, Scoop? I'll ask you, I mean, if a team wanted to sign him, if you're Kaepernick, like, what's your energy right now? Like, do you play for the NFL or do you think that's going to even happen? Um, well, I, I know Warren Moon, uh, a legendary NFL quarterback, was recently on Fox Sports with uh, Kelsey Nicole Nelson and, you know, he said a lot of owners have, 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 have emphasized the fact that, um, you know, if your focus is on social justice, how can you be the quarterback of the team? Um, and, you know, that, that's, that's, that's their prerogative, you know, if, if, if you know, they, they pay the bills or cut the checks in that regard. So, you know, there's, mm-hmm. there's been discussion about, you know, certain teams like we have every year. You know, this year it seems that the team that the people are discussing is the Seattle Seahawks is a potential backup quarterback. Um, so I, I think it's going to be something that is going to be continued a conversation. I mean, it seems as though with everything going on right now, some of the things that, you know, he took a knee for or yeah. the attention was about police brutality is now, you know, revealing itself in time that that's what he was discussing. And, you know, people are now seeing it because they got time to sit and research it. 
So what's interesting, though, about that comment that you just said is you have players that this is their everyday reality. You have players like Darius Leonard, who just experienced being racially profiled in Chipotle, who is a linebacker who is a black male at the end of the day when you take that uniform off and you're driving home you're still a black male so um you know even that statement is just kind of sh- it's it's from a place of privilege i think because you can't put away being a black man when you're out of practice so he's in chipotle uh recently that happened and the chipotle manager asked him to leave saying that he was you know being belligerent or cursing out a, a white man that was there um and those that were in the Chipotle didn't witness that happening. And he basically went on Twitter and spoke like, look, this is the reality. This is what happens to being black in America. You can't even eat in Chipotle without being harassed. So, you know, it's, it's easy for franchises to separate the two, but it's, it's just, it is what it is. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm looking forward to see if they actually do offer Kaepernick. I don't think it's going to happen just because that's really them coming to terms with, hey, we're wrong. And I think the pride of the NFL, they couldn't even apologize to him by name. I don't see them actually saying, hey, we were wrong. You were blackballed. Come back. I want to jump in real quick. So um, in regards to Darius Leonard, because I'm a Colts fan, I know his, his background, as you mentioned, and, and, and you're right, with, with all the issues and obstacles that we're still facing as a society, um, this wasn't Darius Leonard's first time encountering um, this blatant of, of racism. Um, his wife is, is white. They have an interracial child together. And mm. he has even said that during their dating phase in late high school, they had to hide their relationship for that wow. reason. Because he, he grew up in the South and he went to South Carolina State. And there were those that weren't ready to accept that type of relationship. And he yeah. talked about knowing that she was the woman for him because she was with him when his uh, brother had passed away. And how that built their bond. But it's unfortunate that in this day and age, here we are 2020, you can't even order food without having to experience this level of racism. Right. Um, in regards to Kaepernick, as, as Scoop highlighted earlier, the NFL may not actually start up until October. They've already canceled their Hall of Fame game. It looks like they're going to push back their preseason. If I'm Kaepernick, I'm not signing for anything less than a two-year deal. Because if I sign a one-year deal, you're going to sit me on your bench. You're never going to play me. And then you'll wipe your hands at me and make it seem as if, hey, I gave him a shot and it didn't work out. So if I'm Kaepernick, you've got to give me a two-year deal. You've got to give me an opportunity to actually show you what I can do so that if I'm not your starting quarterback, I can position myself to be someone else's starting quarterback. Um, so I, that's how I feel about Kaepernick, as I've always said, and I, and I stand on this. If you're going to give Kaepernick a shot, give him a legitimate shot. Don't just right. bring him in to pacify the masses and, and – and pacify everyone and say, hey, look, we brought him in and he, he just didn't work out. Give him, right. a, give him a shot. So to sign him to a one-year deal now, knowing that you're not going to get a full training camp and he's not going to get an opportunity to really understand your offense would be an injustice to yeah. him as an athlete. Bring him set in on a two-year deal. To set up for failure. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Set him up for failure. So bring him in on a two-year deal. Give him an opportunity to not only learn your offense, but show you he understands and can execute your offense. And then we see where he stands at that point. Yeah, I definitely agree, Eric. Um, I, I was saying before the show, like, I, like I want him to be signed, but I want him to really come in there and play ball because you know he. I want him to just show the world that yeah, I was still good enough to play in this league. Um, I mean, probably was still better than I would say half because he's probably somewhere in the middle of the pack when he when he got um when he when he first uh, started to kneel. So he's probably still in the middle of the pack run. So he could definitely play in this league. So I, I want to see him play. Um, but, again, I do want to see him actually have an opportunity to play. And, Eric, you know, the two-year thing is definitely the way to go because, uh, you know, one of the teams, a team like Seattle, which they were talking about, he may not ever get to play if he signs right. to Seattle because Russell Wilson is there. Russell Wilson rarely gets hurt. So it could be a situation like that. So I do want him to actually have a legit uh, chance at playing. Um, I, I want to switch it over really quick uh, because Scoop, when you came on to the uh, to the program before, you kind of spoke about you know one of your, one of your guys in Brooklyn that's in, in, in the sport of boxing, and um, you know he had did some stuff back at that point where it was just like, bro, come on, especially for me personally because he's representing Brooklyn, and I was like, yo, just what's going on? But uh, Big Baby uh, Miller is back in the news again. He failed the drug test. 
So it's uh, July fight will not be going down. Um, if you guys, you know, at home don't know, uh, Big Baby was also supposed to fight Anthony Joshua uh, yeah. last year when he wound up fighting Anthony Ruiz and losing the belt. So that was supposed to be his title shot right there. He was getting back on track, but then now we've just seen the news come out and um, scoop. So I got to ask you, because, again, that's your guy. I know you wanted him, you know, to, to, to fight Wilder and all these other guys. But, uh, you know, what, what, what's up, man? I spoke to him about a month ago. Um, and, you know, he, he was doing well. He was training. He was traveling and training. And, you know, I, I'm, 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 I'm disappointed. But, you know, you got to follow the rules. You know, and I, and I think that in this situation, you know, he deleted his Instagram account. And I'm sure he's frustrated. And you know, so I think that at the end of the day, um, you know, that big chance last year, you know, would have propelled him. We would have been talking about him in a different light at this point. I mean, we would have been talking mm -hmm. about endorsements with anything from Taco Bell to McDonald's to everything else. I mean, this yeah. guy had has the personality, you know. But, again, you got to follow the rules. And, you know, at the same time, like, um, this is the time really during this pandemic to really prepare for your next. And um, it, it doesn't look good. I don't know. I don't know how you come back from this, to be honest, because this is his third failed test in the last two years. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, Scoop, the, you know, that first one really hurt because Anthony Ruiz stepped in there and capitalized on the moment. And now, you know, to, to get another boxing license to, to regain the trust of the people, I, I don't know oh. where it goes from here, right? You know, I, I hope for him as a man, he figures this out and, you know, he, he gets clean and is able to repair his reputation. But I just don't know how you can move forward with this on your reputation, knowing that there were three failed tests in the last two years. Yeah, yeah it's extremely disappointing, especially because, you know, you know how the world is. We view people, you're as good as your last performance. And it's really hard to, once you develop a good reputation, it's hard to, you know, it's just hard either way to so have a bad one to make it good. But, you know, it's just, um, I hope that he's able to come back from this, but three times, it's kind of like the first time like you slipped up, but the second it's like, yeah. bruh, but three. So, I mean, you know, people make mistakes and I always say money doesn't change you and amplifies who you are. So if you're struggling with something before fame or you did, did, did these things before your success, it's hard to just go cold turkey. So, um, you know, hopefully he realizes he has more so he's so much to lose, you know, and, and so much to gain. And so this is just not, not it. So can, can, we, take a, can we take a quick minute to shout out to, for, for all the Undertaker fans out there? Cause when my main man Undertaker is retired from WWE officially after 30 years, had one of the longest streaks in WrestleMania history, uh, where he just did not lose a match was part of some of the biggest matches in wrestling history period. Some of the biggest rivalries between Shawn Michaels, Triple H, going back and forth with, with The Rock, So Cold. But he is officially uh, wrapping it up. I remember being uh, at WrestleMania in Atlanta when he fought Triple H. And at that point, we were just looking like, yo, if I'm going to take it on, wrap it up soon, he might go down in this ring. And that might be the end of it. But I'm happy that he actually, you know, he's getting the chance to get his flowers while he's still alive. Congratulations right. on, on a great career. Kobe. <laughs> yes. Remember, the video didn't come out with him doing the Kobe. Uh, yeah, yeah. In in a, in a in a dressing room. I I'll never forget. Like you said, thirty years in. I remember seeing him. I was a big wrestling fan as a kid, and the, his first appearance was at a Survivor Series, and he came out with Paul Bearer. And I remember seeing him, and and as a kid, already feeling like, yo, this this dude is kind of scary, and. You know, obviously not seeing the moves or anything yet, just his entrance alone. And 30-year career, he, he definitely held down the sport. He definitely became a mainstay and a major figure within the WWE, man. Shout out to him. Yeah, I, I remember watching uh, WWF superstars on Saturday mornings at noon on Fox 5. And, uh, you know, seeing different interviews and just, you know, seeing Paul Bearer and him. And I also remember uh, when they ended, there were two Undertakers and they fought against each other. Um, I remember Kane and The Undertaker going at it. I recently, a couple months ago during the pandemic, I had uh, 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 Mark Henry on Instagram Live, WWE Hall of Famer Mark Henry, and we were talking about just what it was like, you know, competing with 
on The Undertaker. And it's funny with the whole Kobe thing because um, I asked Mark Henry who would be the WWE, who would be the WWE's Kobe, and he said The Undertaker. He did have the purple on, so you know what I'm saying? He had the Lakers purple. <laughs> we're here, we're here. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What's going to happen, Kobe? I am. You can you can, you can close this out, and we ready we ready to wrap this thing right. up. We got benediction. That benediction. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. I might just say the benediction. All right, let me tell that thing. Well, Scoop, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you everyone for watching another episode of Real Fans Real Talk. I know we we went in on NBA and definitely come back so we can talk more sports and be safe out there, not only with Corona but being black men in America. Okay. <laughs> oh, oh. I'm Emily Marie, and you guys can sign off. Trip Young and Eric. <laughs> Peace. Really quick, just want to say thank you, oh, my fault. And everybody on the front line during this COVID epidemic. I want to stress that every week. Thank you guys from everybody that's working at the hospitals, transit, the grocery stores, whatever you out there doing. If you're on the front yeah. lines, big shout out to you guys. Um, you know, we got to get this thing in order. Uh-huh. This is Real Fans, Real Talk. Talk. Real Fans, Real Talk. We as real as you thought. Real Fans, Real Talk. We the illest of course. Real Fans, Real Talk. We the illest on court. Real Fans, Real Talk. We as real as you thought. Real Fans, Real Talk. Reporting live from the cam. High in demand. So please stand by if you can. What we got is worth a lot. So put a tie on your plans. On court. Talk of sports through the eyes of the fans. With Trip Young, Emma Marie, Eric Sanchez. You heard what I said, we elite. Check the latest topics and stay ahead of the beat. Keep us in your topics and uh -huh. we ahead of the Yo, streets. It's Johnny Flores, bringing a different type of blend. Backing up Misfit to make sure y'all tuned in. You gotta watch, this show is one of a kind. Updates on your TV screen from 8 to 9. For the older folks, so even if you're younger, no matter what sport, this show, we got it covered. It's filmed live in the middle of BK, so we no better sports show to watch on Thursdays. Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought.